Someday, I will not have to follow Rob Horner. <laughs> I know many of you have, so you'll be very sympathetic. So, um, like Rob, I've uh, never really done anything very worthwhile by myself. It's always been with wonderful teams of people, and I uh, have some of them uh, listed that have worked with us on the CISET project. So, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today about lessons that we've learned in CISEP, and in, I was very fortunate to be part of the Technical Assistance Center on Social-Emotional Intervention, the pyramid model for the little guys and what I learned by working with them as well. So I want to talk a little bit about helping districts and schools select interventions, about sustainability and improvement. Uh, what does it take to scale? Uh, first we have to do it, then we'll scale. Uh, and the implications, what are the implications for how we do technical assistance? What does this mean for us? So we're very fond of our formulas for success and I thought I'd just put that in context for you. We need a good what, we're gonna to go to all this trouble uh, let's pick something that is effective and usable, and I'm going to talk about that usable thing uh, in a minute. And then that, if you multiply that times who and how, we need people to do the work and we need evidence-based approaches to implementation. And where does this occur? It's got to occur in an enabling context, because one of the things that we do know is that systems will trump programs. Um, so if you don't have a hospitable environment at the district or school level, that will actually trump any evidence-based program that you um, try to implement. And why are we doing it? Because we want socially significant behavioral and educational outcomes for all children. So let's just talk a little bit about each of these and what we've learned. Um, we do have multiplication signs on purpose. It's just a metaphor. It's not really a math thing. <laughs> Uh, but it is, uh, those of you that are researchers and some of us that aren't know that any number times zero is zero. Uh, so if we have 100% an evidence-based program that's 100% effective and we multiply it times 30% great implementation and, a, and an enabling environment that's 20% facilitative, when you do the math you don't end up with a very big number at the end. So all of these pieces need to be in place, and that means that these are things that are on our technical assistance table that we have to address. Mary Wagner this morning said, um, having an effective intervention, we're not even a third of the way there uh, in terms of getting it to the point where it benefits all students. So let's talk about this what, just for a minute, and what it is we've learned working with districts and schools and with early childhood settings implementing the pyramid model. So one of the things we've learned is not only do you need an effective intervention, but it turns out not all research-based interventions are usable in everyday educational settings. What do we mean by usable? Well, is there a clear description of the instructional or behavioral program? That means what's the philosophy, values, principles, and those are important because they give guidance. You cannot um, give information about every single interaction you have, and when you don't know what to do, you go back to the philosophy and principles of the program. And we need to know for whom it works, right? We're not just gonna go get one of these. Um, the other thing is, what are the essential functions? What are the core components? The things that when they aren't there, we don't have it anymore. Uh, we have gone into the zone of drastic mutation and we're not sure what we have. And then when, for each essential function, we need to operationalize it. And this is why I love, love, love working with special educators. We are better at operationalizing what do we need to say and do to make this work, in part because we get immediate feedback from the children. If we don't say and do, we will, they will tell us. They'll be our best teachers, as Ann Turnbull said this morning. So we need to know for each essential function, what are we saying and doing? And we need a practical measure of fidelity. Did we do what we said we'd do? And we want to get to the point that those measures are highly correlated with student outcomes. So implementation capacity and sustainability are only in service to, I think only useful, when they're in service to something that is usable and effective, a great what, that we can implement, evaluate, improve over time, sustain, and eventually scale. What does this mean? What are the implications for technical assistance? What have we found in our work? Uh, well, first of all, we overestimate the consensus and clarity about the it. Uh, 
and we don't find out uh, that we don't have agreement on what it is, whether it's a multi-tier system of support or a particular reading intervention or what it is we mean by this math program or behaviors, until we start to install it. And we say, well, then how will we train people and who can do it and what kind of coaching? And then, I don't know if you've been in those meetings. I've been in those meetings. We start arguing, well, I didn't mean that, and I thought it was this thing, and no, that, does, that definition is not the right definition. Um, and so what do we have to do then is we have to back up and try again. We have to go back to exploration because we haven't um, defined the usability criteria of the intervention. And there are, we all need to get better at moving then from research-based, research-informed interventions to interventions that also have the usability criteria to go with them. Um, what, what does that mean for our behavior as technical assistance providers? It means that we need to help, in our case, early childhood settings, schools and districts, choose wisely. Um, going back to Rob's, do you want it? You gotta be hungry for it. What are the needs of your children and students, not what is your pet project? Uh, what's the best evidence? What's the fit and resources? Somebody this morning talked about, uh, and we tried to install a direct instruction in a school that was all about whole language. That did not go well. Uh, readiness and resources for replication. Do we have what it takes to get it done? And is the setting, the school or the district ready to install or can you help them get ready? Because if, we, if we're just looking for who's ready, we're gonna continue to create disparities. Help them operationalize the what? Um, so I worship at uh, Jean Hall and Shirley Hord's feet. Um, we have, however, done damage to innovation configurations and have not maintained high fidelity to them. Uh, so, but we do find that practice profiles and rubrics are really important for innovations that we know what are those essential functions, what are the acceptable uh, high quality behaviors, what are developmental expressions of that um, intervention, and what are some things that are unacceptable. When we have that, then we can implement. When we know what it is that we expect everyone to do, then we can implement. Then we can talk about training. Then we can talk about fidelity. Then we can talk about a coach, coaching because we have some agreement and consensus on what it is. And then we have to help them make space for the new. Even if it's just getting rid of the language. I mean, have you ever been in the, in the gym when we say put up all the initiatives? You know, and pretty soon the gym looks like, a, you know, the insides of Big Bird or something. It's all little yellow stickies all over it that look like feathers. And it turns out none of them are really being done. So if we can settle on and or help them create, as technical assistance providers, I think we have to help them become much more clear about what it is. That's our first task with them. Then we have a who is gonna do the work. Really big on teams. And teams are accountable. What's the, what are the core features of teams? They're the, that's the group that's accountable for the work at their level. They need to be implementation science informed, improvement oriented. They're the key to sustainability. They never go away. And they're link, they're, the teams, when they're linked, are the key to scalability, when you start getting teams at multiple levels. So I don't know if any of my Minnesota early childhood people are in the room. Um, this is a early childhood PD system in the state of Minnesota. And um, what you see are the interveners in this case are the regional low incidence facilitators and regional professional development facilitators who were helping with the uptake of a number of evidence-based practices. But what else do you notice about this? Other than there's lots of dotted lines and dashed lines. There's an infrastructure here. There's a scaling infrastructure here to support those people. They're not out there as the recently failed movie Lone Ranger with you know, Johnny Depp uh, on the side. They have an actual system to support them uh, from funding to policy to connections to the broader system. That's all I want you to pay attention to there, but they're great people to talk to about a system. Why do we need teaming structures? Individual champions will come and go. They'll find their next new thing to champion. You need structures to host functions. If we have these essential functions, if we have these core elements of some, they gotta live somewhere. So where are they gonna live? Teams can build, measure, and improve their capacity to implement well. They are improvable in and of themselves. So one of the things that we're doing is try to measure the capacity to implement well and the capacity to scale. 
Um, we can provide you more information about this, but this is a um, state capacity assessment for scaling up of evidence-based practices. So we ask teams at the state level and to look at how measures of how committed the state is to evidence-based education, how coordinated they are, do they have guidance documents, is, what's the leadership like, and what's the commitment to regional structures. And so this is like four years of data uh, from uh, the state that I'm very proudly associated with, Minnesota. Um, and then at the district level, we want them to have the capacity to implement any innovation well. This goes back to Rob's comment about what's the infrastructure so that any innovation that's usable that comes in can be implemented well. So this is district work in Minnesota where they wanted to implement a K-3 literacy program. And we asked them to measure as a team um, how committed they are to it. Do they have teams? What are they doing for system alignment? What about selection, training, coaching, data systems? And then they were able to spot, uh, we give them feedback immediately, thanks to our collaboration with University of Oregon. Michelle Duda's fantastic work on this. And they're ready to start action planning that day um, on what do we do to improve these and should we improve them. I do want to point out on this one, those questions are interesting for folks. While you look at that for a minute, I'm going to get water. Data are only helpful if you're going to do something with them. So this is about action planning. We ask the team to then look, what are the strengths and gains from last time? How do the strengths benefit our state? What are we doing to maintain the strengths? What else can we try? Where are we stalled out? Why? What are the benefits of making gains? What are our next right steps? So um, who some things for us to, that we've had to do at, with both Taxi and SysApp is be ready to negotiate new roles and functions and make uh, the case for the time required to be <coughs> on these teams. Teams are not committees. They're not advisory groups. These are people that do work between meetings and you need to, that's a big change. <clears throat> that there are linked communication protocols, meaning the team at this level has a way to transparently communicate up a level and down a level. How do we do that so that we can get an aligned system? And we need to adopt or create measures of team functioning. I showed you a couple. There's also the um, PBIS's team implementation checklist. How are we functioning? Are we functional in producing the outcomes? <coughs> and then we need to help teams shift their functions as scale up occurs. Training may have occurred at a state level, but now we've gotten too big. We need to push training down to a regional level. Coaching, we used to have just external coaches in one region of the state. Oh my goodness, if we're going to scale up, where are our coaches going to live on which, which team under what conditions? How do we do it? Most of you are familiar with uh, um, NERN and SysUp frameworks. Teams engage in stage-based work, the right work for the right stage. They install and support infrastructure to change and sustain practices. They improve the competence and confidence of teachers and educators. They help change the organization to create alignment and they have leadership that calls out the nasty challenges. And teams use improvement cycles, continuous regeneration. They get started, they get better, they use data on purpose. They use data on purpose to get better. So what does that mean for us as technical assistant providers? It means that we need to provide anticipatory guidance to people about what's coming up. Okay, we're going into initial implementation. It's going to be awkward, the rubber's going to hit the road, and people will want to back away. If I'm dealing mostly with women who have had children, I say, this is the part where you want to get up while you're having the baby and go, no, I've decided it's a bad <laughs> idea, I'm leaving. <clears throat> that will be happening, how are we going to get ready for that? It won't go well. Uh, we have to help ensure and shift the locus of responsibility for each of those drivers, training, coaching, evaluation systems, um, so that as we grow, uh, we can create the infrastructure that needs to be there. We need to normalize through the plan, do, study, act cycle implementation challenges. My colleague in Minnesota, Eric Clue, said, our problem in education is, well, Minnesota is very fond of metaphors, and I love them too. He said, it's sort of like, oh, my car needs an oil change. It's running kind of rough. I think I need to buy a new car. 
And that's pretty much what we do. We don't take, we don't normalize the bumps in the road that are going to occur as implementation occurs. Your job is to ste our job is to steady the course and normalize and go, yep, yeah, this is about how initial implementation looks. Where do these things occur? In an enabling context. What does that mean? It means we have to build a hospitable environment for these practices to live in. Uh, some of them are not friendly. We heard some work this morning. I love that model demonstrations panel. That was like just so great. But we heard things about, oh, you know, really, tier three work with scheduling in high schools? They didn't use this term, but it's a, just an SOB. You know, how do we get that done? The environment and the way that its high schools are structured are not conducive um, to intensive intervention um, in academics. So how do we create hospitable environments over time? And we do that with linking communication protocols and a commitment to solve problems at multiple levels. This is kind of a link structure at Minnesota. So we have a, the, in the middle is the Minnesota implementation team, which is a cross sector, general ed and special ed. They're very proud of that. Um, so that each initiative that occurs in the state has implementation informed work, whether it's teacher and principal eval, um, uh, statewide systems of support for focus and priority schools, um, early childhood race to the top uh, work that's going on, and now common core standards with the integration of um, universal design. So they all have implementation coaches um, to help them do work at the state level. So these are linked teams. The point of this is that information flows up and back as problems surface that can't be resolved at the appropriate level and need to be bumped up. Many things to be discussed about the, this is not a technical thing. I thought it was like a technical thing. Like we're going to develop some linking protocols and we're going to write them and you'll agree to talk to me about these things. Hmm. You're mess, this is messing with the power. You're messing with the power base more over a glass of wine sometime. <laughs> so what does that mean for us? It means we, we need to help teams define their functions and roles. We have to be the ones that can name the adaptive challenge, name the hard task where we are not agreeing on values, ways of work, and how we're going to solve it. We have, to, we have to lift those up. We have to guide the technical and adaptive work of creating team charters, terms of reference, so teams know what they're there to do. And we have to find common ground, but we cannot ignore the divergent needs and pressures of everybody that's involved in a collaboration. We have to appreciate those. Why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this because we care about kid outcomes, back to Rob's data about students. That's why we're doing it, not to get tiny effect sizes but to get big whopping effect sizes um, that really make a difference in kids' lives. So what do we need? I want, never mind, I'm on film, I gotta remember that. What do, we, <laughs> what do we need? We need effective and usable practices. We need teams and people to do the work together and communicate between teams. We need to use the best science about how to implement, just as there's science about the intervention. We need to use science about how to implement well. And over time, we need to create aligned uh, and hospitable environments in which these best practices can live. We invite you to um, look at our imp active implementation hub um, and um, where we're posting more and more tools and processes and for you to share back what you create in your work.